notes, um, describing discoveries of oversized bones, big teeth and remarkable bones that had been buried in heroes' graves. But when Mayer tried to find the exact location of these specimens, she hit a dead end. The archaeologists who had excavated the major temple sites had largely ignored this type of find. They were looking for buildings and for human skeletons and gold and artifacts. So if they found some fossil bones in ancient buildings, they would probably be just sort of ignore it or put it in some warehouse. According to the archaeologists' own records, that's exactly what happened. Every archaeologist has a field book with anomalies on the back pages, and that is where they would uh, make notification of uh, discoveries of remarkable bones or teeth, and they would note what they had done with them, and they had usually gone in the dump. They threw them all out. They, they would actually notate that they had just thrown them away. One remarkable clue from this period of excavations was preserved, but only because of its beauty. Crafted in Corinth in the 6th century BC, around the same time that the giant bones of the hero Orestes were interred at Sparta, this vase depicts Hercules saving the princess Hesione from being sacrificed to Ketos, the monster of Troy. The depiction of the monster long puzzled scholars. It seemed crude and out of place when compared to the other figures. Most of them agreed that it was supposed to depict some sort of sea monster peeking out of a cave. But because I had been looking at so many uh, photographs of fossils, I immediately noticed that it looked a bit like a skull. I sent a Xerox of this vase to paleontologists who were familiar with fossils from the Aegean. And they all noticed the articulated jawbone, the way it's connected with the skull, the extended back of the skull, the eye socket, the backwards leaning teeth, and the really naturalistic detail of the broken off premaxilla, the, the, the uh, nasal area, which always breaks off. It's a very delicate area. The ancients had stylized ways of drawing men, women, clothing, ducks, geese, maybe different other animals like a horse and all this. So we see from vase after vase after vase a very repeated kind of design. What is interesting and striking about this skull is it looks naturalistic. The person who drew it went into great detail and showed a lot of anatomical detail. And their consensus was that this was probably uh, modeled on a Miocene mammal skull and that it was a good depiction of a skull eroding out of a cliff, not a sea monster peeking out of a cave. Was this artist actually linking such fossils to the monsters of myth? The find made Mayer more determined than ever to find the fossils that were so much a part of ancient life. To that end, Mayer focused on a relatively recent excavation begun in 1978 in southern Greece. Among its inventory was a huge thigh bone that had been discovered in the ancient city center. They found it uh, on the Acropolis of the ancient city of Nicoria, so it was collected in antiquity and placed on the Acropolis as a, as a relic from the mythological era, maybe a, a local hero. Was this so-called hero's bone actually a prehistoric fossil? Unfortunately, the archeologists hadn't bothered to accurately identify it in their publications. The bone had been considered insignificant to those excavating the site but it was vital to Mayer. I began making inquiries, but it turned out that uh, the bone had apparently disappeared. And I kept pestering people until I found that it uh, was in someone's uh, basement in a cardboard box. In the summer of 1998, Mayer was finally able to obtain the specimen and lost no time enlisting the help of Nikos Salunius, a paleontologist associated with the Museum of Natural History in New York, to help her with the identification. And we spent the day comparing that bone to the thousands of bones that they have from Greece in the collections at the museum. And Nikos finally determined that the fossil bone that was collected in antiquity in Nicoria and put on the Acropolis belonged to a woolly rhinoceros from the Pleistocene era. And this magnificent creature had fossilized maybe 
a million, two million years ago. Here, finally, was irrefutable proof. The ancient accounts were true. Before the birth of Christ, and in the first centuries afterwards, the Greeks and Romans had hunted for and prized these prehistoric fossils as much as any modern paleontologist. Like today's scientists, they recognized that these were organic remains from a primordial era and created theories as to how these animals might have looked in life. The only difference, they conjured up mythological monsters instead of woolly mammoths. Over the next few years, Mayer was able to trace the whereabouts of a similar example, a large mammal femur found in the Temple of Hera on Samos among a collection of dedication offerings dating to the 7th century BC. Two key pieces of evidence had been salvaged from the hundreds of fossils that had been excavated and discarded, consigned to the garbage heap in much the same way that the Greek stories of monsters and giants were relegated to the realm of fantasy. Mistakes have been made. That's part of the science. Science, you know, progresses and paleontology in particular by building upon discovery after discovery. Was the first paleontological discovery made not in the 1600s or the 1800s, but some 2,000 years earlier? Were the ancient Greeks the first to hunt prehistoric monsters? I always wanted to give the ancient Greeks a better grade in paleontology. The fact that they collected and measured and displayed these fossils, uh, these are preconditions of scientific inquiry. They didn't have a formal science of paleontology, obviously, to explain the fossils, but the theories that they came up with are uh, fairly accurate if you, if you think about it. How far back does paleontology go? My guess is that for almost as long as humans have been what we'd call humans, they've been picking up interesting things, and among those were fossils. 